All right, so welcome here, everybody who's watching online. Uh, Mark Oxer here, calling from Alberta, Canada, and Sarah Holcomb, and I'm going to pronounce this correctly: Boise, <laughs> Idaho. Uh, I just learned how to say that correctly, and so yeah, we just wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, primarily talk about women in sport. Sarah's been a uh, big advocate for that, and we just wanted to talk about uh, women in sport. And uh, just even with what's going on in our sort of our climate and our culture right now, just to continue to maybe address some of the stuff about diversity and inclusion. And, and yeah, so I don't know if you want to, if there's something that's on your heart or your mind, if you want to uh, start off with right away, or you want to maybe ease into it a little bit, tell us a little bit about um being a, a 968 rated player and having almost 90 career wins and uh and maybe sure. i think most people probably know who you are being the number five ranked uh female player in the world but <laughs> no worries yeah i mean yeah um so yeah i started playing disc golf in 2007 just casually with friends i was teaching high school science at the time and I kind of, I just got addicted to it, just like so many of us have, and it was, totally. it kind of sparked my, I, it sparked my interest when I got invited to play with a friend, and he actually, like, hit an ace off a tree the first time I played, which was really cool to see, awesome. and then I, that same day, I met some of the local players out there, um, and they invited me to join their league, so I was like, okay, uh, let's try that, and after one day at league, I realized I should probably practice. <laughs> <laughs> So I kind of got obsessed with practicing and um, I started just playing every single day. And then, you know, I started playing local tournaments and then regional tournaments and then bigger tournaments and realized that I was, um, I could be, this is something that I was not only addicted to, but I could be successful at it. So I took the leap about, about 2011 um, and quit my teaching job and started touring full time. And since then, you know, I've got a, a world title, a couple national titles yeah. and uh, several big wins um, over the years. And for I've sure. got the chance to travel the country for about a decade and see the world and meet people and spread the love of disc golf. Um, so, and specifically as a, uh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 keep going, keep going. No, and specifically um, this, it, it has really opened my eyes to um, the difference um, in the way men and women are treated in sports. Mm. especially when it comes to um, sports outside of the realm of Title IX. Okay. Right? So back in the 70s when Title IX was first enacted, it increased the participation rates drastically for right. women. But it's only regulated. It's only, it's only, a, a, it's only, it only applies to federally funded situations, right? Okay. So um, schools universities it does not apply to professional sports okay um so we you know as a as a child and as an adult or as an adolescent um a teenager i was kind of protected by that by that um law to ensure that i had equal access to sports right um and there wasn't an, and i never i didn't feel that i didn't feel that there was some disparity in those situations. You know, I had a full scholarship in college, you know, a lot of other women did. And even now in college sports, we're seeing that there's more women playing sports than men in the, yep. in the collegiate level, yep. which is showing how important that legislation was. Right. Um, but then as you get into the professional side, as I started touring, I didn't realize how, I didn't realize what it, the environment was actually like. Um, mm. When I first started touring, there was really only a handful of us out there touring. And so it'd be difficult to even find tournaments where I could play against um, a full card or two cards. A lot right. of times where I'm looking for a tournament with just four people or eight people. Um, and that was like a good thing back in, um, you know, the early 2010, 2011, stuff like that, that those years. Um, and then I also started to notice huge disparities in payout, mm. as well as huge disparities in um, what sponsors would offer me versus a comparable male player right. um so you know it's 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 under that umbrella that we are where we are that where i have found this passion to try to make a difference in that realm and there's so many factors that go into it and, and it's not just disparity at the professional level it's also trickles all the way down to you know every um every parallel between men and women in the sport right. you know we just see so few women playing 
um, despite our best efforts, we've not been able to push that needle further than seven to eight percent. Even though we've had this huge blow up in the number of women that actually play the sport, the men's side of the sport seems to kind of grow, grow organically. Whereas right. the women's side, we really have to be proactive in order to make a difference and push that needle a little further. My goal would be to get 20% participation amongst women as a more of a short-term goal. I think that that's realistic and comparable to other sports such as tennis and, um, and traditional golf. So that's kind of the goals um, in my mind. And there's a lot of, uh, so many different, it's you know multifaceted in the ways that we can approach um, projects to reach those goals. Right, yeah. No, that, and I think you said a lot in there and I appreciate, uh, appreciate all that you said there already. So how would you, how do you, how have you guessed I've seen, you said you really saw kind of it growing from like 2011 on, even within the last probably two to three years, you've probably seen it grow even more than that. And you talked about how the men's game seems to grow a little bit more organically. How, how do you foresee maybe being able to help grow the women's game a little bit more organic, organically or to implement some of these ideas that you have to help grow the women's game or is there is there barriers that are occurring right now within the sport uh, that are maybe hindering that and so one of the things that has come up time and again when I've been trying to ask questions about this is it may sound silly but we need bathrooms on the courses right so yes uh, the, I've always <laughs> said that if um it, it is. It's really awkward. You know, I mean, totally. we have to drink water to stay hydrated on the course. But yeah. then once you drink the water, it's going to go through you and <laughs> you need to get rid of it. Yeah. And, you know, so I found myself just staying relatively dehydrated in order to avoid the bathroom situation. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it is. It's really embarrassing to have to find a bush or a tree or a part of the woods and you, you have to go in there and as a woman you have to literally pull your pants all the way down yeah you know exposing yeah. you know things that you don't necessarily need to expose to the public right i've um, trying to do it discreetly um and then yeah. you know there's i mean i'm just gonna go into detail a little bit because i don't think men realize how yeah. easy how hard it is to not pee on your toes or on your <laughs> leg or um you know and then you're dealing with you know are we am i carrying toilet paper around right. to you know to clean myself how are we handling, you know, it, it is a problem, you know. Um, so, how, you know, I always say that if men had to pull their pants down to pee, there'd be bathrooms every three holes. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, you, how do you suggest mitigating such a basic human need on the disc golf course? I mean, I think for me, I mean, if, if there's not access to proper facilities, I think the clubs or the course people, whoever is in charge, should take it upon themselves to rent a porta potty, put mm. it in a place, rent a porta potty. The club should maintain a porta potty on every course. I really think that that is, it's not that much to ask. It is a cost. It's not that much to ask, but I, I think that it would make a difference for, um, for the ladies and also the men out there, you know, I mean, there's yeah. plenty of men that, you know, it's not, they, you know, there's, couple different ways to use the bathroom <laughs> it's not as easy as number one is way easier than number two yeah for um, sure. so anyway just for the whole community i mean of course there's some women that will still choose to go into the woods because some porta potties are really disgusting yeah for sure <laughs> but if they're if they're there and properly maintained i think that that's one small thing um that people can that people in charge can do um to help um but you know it, it's it's not just that that's a that's one thing but yeah for sure we definitely have issues with course design. Mm. Um, I think that there's this idea that in disc golf that we have we haven't expanded our understanding or our our uh, course philosophy or kind of course design philosophy enough for people to realize that you know just like traditional golf we should have separate tees for okay. different skill levels right you know not even just you know the fpos are probably on like a second tee you know but then you've got you know women coming out there and and new players not just women um new players coming out there that only throw 100 150 feet right you know and it's it's not an encouraging thing to go out to a course and throw six times and still not be at the basket for sure. You know, so I really think that we need a bigger variety of courses and more T options at current courses to accommodate the wide variety of skill sets. 
for sure. Um, especially our juniors. I really think that we've done them a disservice. Um, you know, there's, I mean, the juniors will go out there and throw nine times on a so, regular hole. I just, I'm going to poke in for one second on that because so I, I made a, like, it's not, a, it's not a surprise for people that I'm applying for a PDJ board position. And one of the things that I taught, wanted to talk about was women and youth. And I, uh, there was had several people talk to me and say, don't group, group women and youth together because women and juniors or women and youth players often get grouped together in tournament play. And it's actually a little bit like, I feel like, I don't feel like an equal because you're just like, oh, I'll shove the kind of women over there with the, with the youth players, right? Um, and so, yeah, just I think that there's a lot of value in, in what you're seeing here. Um, and maybe, yeah, just keep, continue to expand on that and, the, and how we're not yeah. doing our juniors a favor. But also, I don't think we're doing our, our female players a favor either, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, anybody who's not an average, um, like, basically advanced, intermediate, maybe even I would even say rec, rec, advanced, intermediate, open men, the open women are also still, and I are also, you know, we're, we're doing all right on a regular course, and so are the advanced women. But if you go intermediate women and below, and then I would say almost all the juniors, probably um, the um, 15 and under, 12 and under, you know, those, those, that group of people, is, they're, not, they're not getting to play golf because all the courses are just too long. Right. And then I would say that also extends to our, our more senior population. Yes. Um, I love it. So I, I really think, so I actually, it's funny that we're talking about this particular situation right now. Um, I re just recently released a survey through the PDGA Women's Committee where we're actually evaluating all the different divisions and trying to find out where, what, what kind of distances do they throw mm. so that when course designers and TDs are out there trying to create an appropriate course, that they have some information to assist them to make sure that it's a challenge that's appropriate for that group. So I'm hoping that this survey and the, the data we're able to collect will kind of inform those decisions. Because right now it seems like course designers and TDs have assumptions about how far people throw and what's an appropriate place um, to tee from and to tee to. But um, I don't think we have any real data about that. So okay. I'm hoping that that makes a big difference. But it's not even just the physical things, I think, well, that even, really... Go ahead. Yeah, it's not just the physical things, the bathrooms and the course design that, does, that makes women less apt to find the sport appealing. I think it also has to do with the simple fact that there's, they feel like a minority mm. out, out there. Um, right. You know, I mean, if you're... There's not like a dis if you could picture as a male, I try to relate this to you. Yeah, um, for sure. if you could picture yourself, um, possibly how about um, I'll pick a very female um, activity like like dancing. Right. Right. Um, if you were going to a dance class and it's a whole bunch of women and you, right? Um, you have a different body than they do. Right. You're also when it comes socially, when it comes to something socially, you're going to be a little uncomfortable when they start talking about their period, right. you know, or they start, you know, talking about things that are, are specifically female um, kind of conversations. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think it's kind of similar to that type of thing. And your body moves differently. It's going to be much different for, more difficult for you to get into a split. You know, the, you yeah. know, a, a lot of the other, I don't, I don't know much about dancing, so I, I'm a little out no, of No, it's okay. It's make a parallel. It's um, but, you know, your body's going to be moving differently. You're not going to be able to make the shapes just the same way that the other, that the women do. Um, so I think that that's another, you know, so for women um, in general, joining a sport like this, it's intimidating to go out there and try to, you know, do their best in front of a bunch of men who are all watching. They're all watching her too, you know, like right. they're like, whoa, a woman on the course, <laughs> you know, and, and I think for by and large, most of the men are really friendly and maybe too friendly sometimes, but I think that they, I think that they want the women there. I really yeah. do, but it's, there's nothing that they personally can probably do um, to, to really make them feel welcome. It's just simply the fact that there's no other women there or very few other women. Yeah. So well, I think that once we get more women there, it will snowball a little bit more and kind of that organic growth that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. I think that that will come naturally. It's, we just need a bigger percentage of us being on the course to make more women feel comfortable. 
So how, I guess there's a couple of things. I'm just thinking about the physical perspective. And uh, like I said, I spent 15 years coaching uh, collegiate soccer for female athletes. And uh, so I've heard a lot of those conversations be just being in and around the dressing room and around the girls who as we're traveling and spending so much time with them. Um, so I'm familiar with what you're trying to address. So it's okay that you didn't understand that you can't uh, anal make dance analogy work. That's totally okay. Um, but even just things like I had a couple of females uh, send me messages just out of curiosity and say, this is a tough one to ask, but like when you're talking about like doing like reach back and then pulling through, I have a big chest and I can't pull through. It doesn't work the same way physically. Yeah. Like the biomechanics don't work the same. Right. And she's like, so I go and watch these YouTube videos on how to throw or guys keep telling me like draw it across your chest or this. And then she's like, I can't. <laughs> yeah. And so there's just those, like some of the physiology differences. Um, yeah, all. specifically, specifically, we see physiology differences in the hip shape, the shape and size of the hips. Yeah, um, totally. that is a huge factor, um, along with just the amount of upper body mass that men have compared to women. Yeah. In addition, um, there's differences in the arm bone length as well yeah. that yeah. offer men a little bit more power. I don't know physiologically why that is. I can't explain that, but I know it exists. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it is a it is useful for lifting and throwing sports um, when it comes to um, the comparison sure. to men. Um, and, and that brings me to another important point um, about the trouble, one of the barriers. Um, well, it's not really a barrier of participation, more so a, a structural issue, a, an issue with retention, okay. right? Because once a woman tries it, you know, most women are pretty discouraged the first time they try to throw a frisbee. For sure. You know, a lot of them don't get very far and then they feel like they're holding people up and they're embarrassed. They feel unathletic, you know. Um, so they have to get over that huge hump. And, and what I've noticed is that plenty of, um, because of the structure of our bodies compared to men's bodies, I think a lot of men will get immediate success on distance. I'm not immediate, but they'll have, uh, they'll be able to throw much further right off the bat, even with poor form. Even if it just hyzers um, off every time. <laughs> right. But they're still probably throwing it a couple hundred feet, even, probably. even on a, even without very good form. Right? right. And that's simply, they're just muscling it out there. Right. Um, whereas with women, because we don't have that upper body strength, I think that it really takes good form for women to get distance. Right. Yep. So something that, you know, so comparing that, you know, um, I think men are going to have in, more instant success and women are going to be more instantly discouraged For just sure. due to the fact that, you know, they can muscle it out further than women right off the bat. And it does take good form for women to really feel like they can get distance. So I think that's part of it as well. You know, I mean, I think we need really, we need, we need really good coaching at a beginner level specifically mm. for women. How do you propose... I mean, that's sort of my background. Like I said, I spend a lot of time coaching and actually I'm working outside of all of this other stuff. I'm working on trying to develop some online education for, for the sport of disc golf uh, within that coaching realm. And it's different than what like um, the, some of the other educational pieces that are existing already out there is doing. This is specifically kind of more wanting to be geared towards what the coaches are doing and how coaches could be the most effective in, in what they're doing. But yeah, I just, I guess the question would be is how, with that said, how would you maybe articulate or give examples or give suggestions on how to best coach uh, some of the, the female players or junior players or senior players um, in introducing them to the sport, knowing that they're not going to be able to, to throw as far or, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would defer that question to Zoe Andike, honestly. Yeah. Um, I find it very difficult to teach brand new players. I don't have a, most of my clinics and my successes as a coach come from um, a more experienced player who I'm, you know, similar to the way I, I critique my own game. I can see little things that they're doing slightly wrong or slightly off and I can help them identify those and fix them when right. it comes to breaking it all the way down for, for a brand new player on what they should focus on and which what is the most important things I don't really know <laughs> I know I don't I really don't um I I don't and I also don't usually volunteer for kids clinics because of that reason okay is that's not a skill that I personally have developed over the many years I've done I've played um, but 
uh, Zoe and I has promised to yeah. teach me how to teach beginners. So yeah, um, that's, she was one of the ones I was referring to, but uh, I, like uh, without sort yeah, of saying so, it for sure. Yeah. So you play disc golf. Universal Play yeah. Disc Golf is her nonprofit, yeah. and um, so yeah, that's one of their goals is creating curriculum for, um, sure. for all ages. Yeah. Um, in order to teach them. So I look forward to working with her and developing those skills. That's awesome. So uh, there is a, so I'm just thinking about the organic growth. I th from my experience, uh, talking with some of the, the female players that I've talked to, and even just my wife and some of the people that she's connected through, most of the women seem to have come through the sport um, from a boyfriend or a husband or some sort of male influence has said, Hey, why don't you come out? Or maybe the guy's like, I really want to go out, but it's easier if I ask my wife, cause then I don't feel like there's <laughs> whatever it happens to be. But they seem that the, the females, a lot of the females who have come to the sport have come from a, a male inviting them. Do you possibly have maybe some ideas on how to help continue to facilitate invitations to the sport? I know that there are some brands uh, brands, not the right term, manufacturers out there that have uh, programs to uh, promote uh, people having their first disc within the sport. And I'm just, there's been ideas thrown around about, about doing things like that to have, say, like pink discs or what have you to, every guy gets a pink disc and then invite your girlfriend, your spouse, your cousin, whatever it happens to be, and to come out and play. Do you have maybe some ideas on how to help facilitate some of that, that growth and exposure to the sport? Well, I don't have a lot of ideas other than, you know, person to person contact. Okay. Um, a lot of counties will have um, outdoor days, you know, um, local yeah. rec, rec, parks and recreation departments will right. have, you know, a get to know your recreation situation. Um, I think that those are great. For outreach to people who have never heard of disc golf right um, I definitely think working in the schools right. working yeah, in huge. the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts yeah. working basically working with any group church groups as well I think that that's a great activity you know um, yeah. on on a Wednesday night church group awesome um, I think any of that is great I also really you know with um, you know as as we're facing this issue with um, diversity in our country right now um racism and you know we can look at disc golf and see that we don't have that many people of color right you know it's a predominantly white male sport yeah and i think disc golfers are really i don't think disc golfers are racist people in general no. at all i don't think it's because we haven't welcomed them but i do think that it's obvious that there's not a, a large percentage of there's not a lot of diversity and i think that you know, this is an opportunity for us to maybe service communities that haven't really learned about the sport. For sure. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that works, maybe through boys and girls clubs or through um, community churches or something. I'm not exactly sure. Other, maybe, maybe it's working with parks and recs departments that live are, are in predominantly um, diverse communities or something. Right. I'm not exactly sure, but I definitely think that we can um, use this as a... Um, I don't know, a canary in a coal mine of a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for to, sure. You know, to realize that, you know, I don't think we're racist, you know, like we're not a racist group of people, but yeah, we can do more as well. For you sure. Know, to make, to diversify our sport. Well, I think if you look at, if you were to compare it, like oftentimes disc golf gets comp compared to ball golf. And if you were to look at ball golf, you could, you could say the same thing. And there's a lot of white male dominance that happens within the sport of ball golf. There's a huge difference though between the sports in that the barrier to entry for disc golf is exponentially lower than the barrier to entry for disc golf, right? So you can go literally to the dollar store, pick up Frisbee. It's probably not the, the best Frisbee that you could pick up, but you could pick up a really cheap Frisbee. Um, I know that like uh, I, was, I was helping out with some leadership stuff back in my home province and it's just absolutely exploded during this time of COVID. I, I think what's happened during the time of COVID is probably actually going to push the sport forward a couple of years ahead of where it was expected to be just because so many people are like, well, I can play disc golf and I don't have anything else to do right now. And so I have started picking it up and I've seen a lot of posts on social media just being like, anybody know where I can buy a starter pack? Right. And so people spend their 30 bucks, get their three disc starter pack and they can play and they don't have to pay green fees. They don't have to do that. Like all these other things. 
the sport is so accessible to people of almost any social and economic standing within in within our society uh and then that it's just like there's no reason that we can't have everybody participating in this right so yeah um, i would agree with you um and i would guess that part of it is access to courses um i know that uh, i don't know where i got this statistic so it may be i don't know just take it for what you will but um i feel like most people aren't willing to travel more than like 20 minutes on a weeknight to go play that might be you know, an American it, thing, though. <laughs> very well could be. Very well could be. So, again, take it, qualify that data however you'd like. But, you know, when you, when you don't have a course near you, yeah. it, it becomes, you know, it, it's not as, it's, it, it's hard to get addicted to it. It's a hard to, totally. you know, it's to really foster that fun when you have a long travel time. So I think part of that is making sure that we have, you know, courses everywhere. Yeah. Um, and also in, you know, areas of the country that, you know, that are more diverse. For sure. You know, I mean, the mid, so yeah, I, I think that we could target parks and recreation departments in areas that we don't have anything yet. Yeah. Um, so this would be, this is a little bit off and I won't, I won't land on it for very long, but just even thinking, so like I said, I, I spent most of my life living in, um, Winnipeg, Manitoba, or just North of Winnipeg, Manitoba. We have snow that's waist deep six months of the year. <laughs> so even if we had courses, I mean, you can go out and play them, but it's minus 40 degrees outside with a wind chill and you've got waist deep snow. You're not, you're not going to go out and play uh, a lot of days of the year because of that, right? So mm -hmm. uh, looking at how we can provide opportunities for not just people, um, so that they can go to a specific course, but is there also opportunities that we can provide? And like you said, with, with church programs, with, with uh, like things like the girl guide programs or with 4-H programs or sort of other youth orientated or maybe gender orientated or um, senior oriented, senior oriented. Oh man. Yeah, for sure. Or like I said, like, like, like a people group orientated that can meet them where they're at um as a starting point or even to uh, fit into the where they're at with their climate conditions or their social conditions right so to just meet them where they're at with with those types of things like i said i know that could be a whole conversation itself we don't have to land there for very long but it just we we kind of touched on it so um, yeah there's certainly um over the last few years we've seen an explosion of putting leagues indoor putting leagues over the winters yeah i think that that's a great way for the community to stay bonded even when there's poor weather for sure. You know, um, and pairing something like that with uh, maybe a little bit of video of, um, of the professionals throwing and so you can kind of help them understand what part of the game they're working on. But maybe we're indoor in a gym in the wintertime and For sure. put up on the screen and, you know, some a highlight video to show people what, what it's all about. And then, yeah. you know, you're throwing short shots or putting. I think that that's possible. I think that you could really introduce people to the sport with inside of a gym. I think we see... Uh, one of your countrymen doing that quite a bit, Robert McClode. Yeah, right? he act, so Robert and I Rob, actually Frisbee just, Rob. yeah, Frisbee Rob, we actually just played around together uh, oh. two days ago. Awesome, yeah. 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 He can so. bomb it, man. <laughs> 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 I don't know yeah. that that's not just the point of the sport, but wow, he can really throw a disc far. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so he's a good model of how, sure. how to get into schools and um, certainly yeah. introducing it to so many people through his work. Yeah, uh, he does awesome stuff. For those who aren't familiar, I'm gonna put a shout out to him. Uh, Rob McLeod, also known as Frisbee Rob. He goes around primarily in Canada uh, into the school systems and teaches Frisbee. He doesn't just teach the sport of disc golf, but he will teach uh, like tricks, he'll teach ultimate, he'll teach disc golf. But then similar to what Zoe has is he's very good with kids and just engaging them in play and engaging them in games and engaging them in uh, in fun with the disc but then he also uses it for teaching lessons uh, he talks about some resilience with stuff and some of the, the teachings that he does he does things where he uh, he gets them to put down electronics and use discs and stuff so uh, just a shout out to frisbee rob he does some really awesome stuff in getting programming to schools and the more that we can do that for sure the more that that's it's going to make a difference as well so anyways uh, all good stuff, but yeah, we can we can sort of bring it back maybe a little bit to 
uh, where we started the conversation with uh, women in sport. And so I personally, and I might be in the minority in this, uh, I know that some of the friends that I've talked to agree with me, uh, actually prefer watching FPO play because I can watch it as a average player and go, that's a shot that I could try to make. That's the route that I would try to maybe play this hole as opposed to when I watch some of the guys and I go, well, yeah, that's really cool that you just threw a 650 foot shot and parked it. I mean, like, awesome. It was, it's phenomenal to watch and exciting to watch. And these guys are like, like shooting crazy scores on the course, but for 99.9% .9 of the people who are playing, it's not realistic. <laughs> And so I, I would agree with you for that reason yeah. I'm watching FPO. So yeah. yeah, I try to encourage people who seem hesitant to, to watch the women. I try to use that exact same um, logic to try to convert them over to the FPO viewing side. Um, yeah, I find the same thing actually personally when I'm <laughs> practicing with some of the elite men, I don't get much out of it other than just shock and awe, you know? <laughs> I definitely am not following their lines um, almost ever, you right. know. So yeah, I, I can appre I can totally. I think that one of the one of the one of the tougher issues to tackle is that in our society we don't really value um, skills, technical skills, as much mm. as we va we value pure power. For sure. Um, and in this sport, you know, um, I think that's really what puts the women at a disadvantage when it comes to publicity and getting viewers and getting people excited about it is, right. you know, we're so often compared to the men in our yeah. coverage, even, you yeah. know, I've done, I've been guilty of myself, you know, saying um, when I'm doing commentary on a particular hole, I'll even say, oh yeah, we're playing from a hole that's or a tee that's 150 feet shorter than the men's tee, you know, and, and I, I and I really feel like the, that, not comparing the top elite men and the top elite women on the exact same course right. is a better idea than than publicly displaying the fact that women don't throw as far right you know so, i think it can be just as impressive to watch women play totally um and to see their skill sets and the and the technicality of the shots and the totally. um and the consistency in certain areas um but the public is really keen on um, the big distance shots and yep. um, a lot of that, which I can't blame them, you know, but I think that they're missing some really great stuff um, sure. on the other side. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of pose to you two questions then with that. So obviously the question of FPO coverage, I know a lot of females that I've talked with have said, give us more FPO coverage, please. Can we have more FPO coverage? Because we want to see females playing because then it's somebody that I can look to and, look up to and sort of mimic or like strive to be like so uh really begging sort of for that F more fpo coverage um but again the sort of the second piece of that is i'm very familiar with the sport of crossfit i'm not sure uh, how familiar you are with the sport of crossfit but they do a very they've seemed to do a, they've seemed to have done a very good job of balancing the sport both male and female and saying you know what we have our elite male competitors we have our elite female competitors i mean all I say this all with sort of the caveat that CrossFit is completely going down the toilet right now with what happened with the, mm. the CEO of the organization. But uh, traditionally up till now, the sport has done a really good job of saying, here's our elite male athletes. Here's our elite female athletes. They get paid the same. If you win the CrossFit games as a male, you get paid the same as winning CrossFit games as a female. We don't care. Uh, we also know that when we have a deadlift ladder, the male deadlift ladder is going to go something like 400 pounds, 500 pounds, 600 pounds. And the female deadlift ladder is going to go like 250 pounds, 350 pounds, 450 pounds. And yes, the weights are lighter, but it's equally as impressive to see this female athlete lift 450 pounds as it is to see this male athlete lift 600 pounds. And they've done an incredible job of showcasing and highlighting the success of the athlete relative to their competitors and relative to uh, the sport and not putting them side by side and saying, oh, she only lifted 450 pounds, which was the opening weight for what the, all the male athletes did, right? And instead of going, holy smokes, that was absolutely amazing that she pulled that weight uh, and gets super excited about mm -hmm. it. And so how to bring, how to bring yeah. a little bit of that culture and then like I said, how yeah. to like, 
maybe increase is increasing FPO coverage the solution to the problem or is there other pieces? yeah part of it it's part of it but uh, it, it that's a very interesting uh, I like the way you you described the way that they promote the different uh, genders within it uh, and I feel like um, if we were if it was disc golf in that situation um, if it was disc golfers they would say um, oh, okay cool she won but she didn't even lift you know she didn't but she but there's always that but but she didn't right. lift as much as he did right you know and then right. they would use that as a reason why we shouldn't get paid as much <laughs> now question and this they do this in tennis as well actually they complain that the women only play matches to three and the men play them to five why should they yeah. get the same yeah okay um i'm not here to really debate that but collegiate volleyball is the example? same thing. yeah um yeah uh, so my question to you about CrossFit is, is, are you aware of any, are there participation, major participation differences in men and women? And when the competitions are set up, are they set up, um, the, you know, are the men and women paying the same? Do they have the same number of registration spots? Um, how are they justifying that they're being paid the same? Right. Basically. So from, I'd have to double check the numbers, but I know that CrossFit has made it an intention of the sport to make it as equal as humanly possible within the sport. Now, when you look at uh, events at the higher levels, when you look at the CrossFit Games, for example, there is the same number of male participants as there is female participants at the CrossFit Games. And they've done, they've done that intentionally. There's the same payout. And they've intentionally structured that from the very sort of get-go of the sport and saying, we, will, we want to showcase and highlight our female athletes in the same way we highlight our male athletes. And one of the ways that we can do that is to pay them exactly the same, right? And so they've had the, for, the, the blessing, I guess, of uh, working with corporate sponsorships uh, through things like Reebok and Rogue that have helped fund them as well as through those corporate, corporate sponsorships. Um, but they made it part of their culture from the get-go to say, we are going to highlight our female athletes just as much as our male athletes. Now, the interesting portion to say alongside of that in talking about all this diversity stuff, it is still a humongously white-dominated sport. So uh, despite the fact that CrossFit has done a lot of work to reach out to uh, other countries, uh, and do a lot of outreach work, it does seem to be a still fairly dominated uh, white sort of sport. And I know that they're working hard to, to, to try to mitigate that, but um, as far as the gender bias goes, they have made it uh, a very intentional to, to keep it as equal as possible and just say, we're going to do our payouts the same and that kind of stuff. So. I know you mentioned this at the very beginning when we were talking with regards to tournaments and regards to payouts and the difference between the genders. Um, I have some yeah, personal so ideas on how to fix that, but I would love to hear your sort of thoughts as someone who's lived through that difference. So the differences will work themselves out eventually, I think. Um, once we get so many women that we can, we can field a similar field size we can we can right. fill a similar field size as the men but right. right now there's you know 150 men chomping at the bit to get into registration right um and there's only maybe 30 or 40 women doing the same right you know so in order to actually have equal registration numbers tournament directors would have to say sorry but only 40 of you <laughs> get to play so we can make it equal and, and of course that sounds that's kind of a ridiculous um way to handle it um so there's a couple of points i wanted to kind of touch on here sure so we see um we see equitable pay in crossfit as you mentioned we yeah. see equitable pay at majors in tennis yeah um and we see equitable pay in surfing yep right yep um and so it makes me go back to actually an article i recently read um it was put out actually by the canadian sports authority of some sort some kind of sports people <laughs> <laughs> it is we, it is we do have those up here <laughs> you have sports up there okay um <laughs> so it was it was a study done about canadian um participation rates among women okay and a lot of it what what the end result kind of came to was that um we need to evaluate barriers to participation yeah kind of like we've, we've touched on just a little bit yeah. and then we also need to look at the structure of the activity 
and make sure that there are not um, elements to the way it's structured that are creating these huge disparities in the numbers of people that are trying to play, right? right? So the payout structure is one of the things that I would guess has something to do with an, the issue we're seeing with lack of women. Right. And I don't know if it's a chicken and egg thing. I can't tell you, you know, whether, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what will fix it because I know that simply just giving the women equal pay in every situation is, is going to cause major uproar against the men. And in my mind, I'm have, having trouble justifying it, even oh, as can someone I, who may be receiving those payouts. Can I pose a question back to you with regards to that? So I've heard a, a few ideas about this. And one that I thought was kind of interesting was to say, uh, if you say, for example, you have a tournament, you have 30 intermediate males registered for the tournament, and you have six intermediate females registered for the tournament, rather than saying you have 30 and six, put them together and say, I've got a division of 36 intermediate players. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming and playing from the same tees because of, as we've discussed, there's differences and, and those types of things. But from a financial perspective and from a payout perspective saying, I have 36 intermediate players and I'm going to allocate my payout based on that. And so I know that they're, I know that it's not a perfect system, but because like I said, you're going to have some people going, well, you're going to pay out now, you're going to pay out the top 10, 10 male players. And then the, the top four or five female players are going to get paid out. And the top, the first place in each division is going to get the same, but that doesn't make sense. And it does not fair. And, uh, I know that it's not a perfect solution, but I'm just trying to think again, trying to how we can sort of look at options to to try to maybe balance that out. Yeah, I've thought that same, I've thought of similar options to that. Um, I, I haven't thought about it on the amateur side per se, because I don't have a lot of experience there. And typically their price payouts, they're not really actually making cash. So right. it's a little bit different. For sure. um, but I've always thought, I've always wondered, one of the questions of structure affecting inequity um i've thought okay entry fees it makes perfect sense that if you play in a particular division your entry fee should go to that division and should be part of the payout for that particular division sure right so say let, let's say you have you know a hundred let's say let's say we have 80 men and 20 women 100 right. people total yep you know that that that's not an unrealistic situation today 80 men for 20 sure. women that's right um so you have 100 total right but the yep. 80 that, let's say let's say it's a hundred dollars for each entry fee, right? Yep. So we have we have eight hundred uh, we have eight thousand dollars on the men's side, and we have two thousand dollars on the women's side just right. from entry fees. Yeah. So then my next the next part of the payout equation is added cash. Right. And I think that added cash, bonus money, bonus series, tour series bonuses, those yep. types of things, I think those can be split down the middle. 100%. You know, because that is money coming from sponsors. That's money coming from um, local fundraising. That's not money coming out of the male competitor's pockets. Right. Right. It's, right. I can understand if they're like, you can't take the money I put in and give it to the women. Right. That should go to the winner and the men's. But why do we, why is the added cash in particular um, also tied to participation rates? Right. You know, yep. I think that that might be something that we can explore. I don't know right. how it would happen and I don't, I, I wouldn't get into any kind of specifics, yeah. but, but I, I think, think that's, that's where something. some of that corporate sponsorship makes a difference too, right? So when, yeah. when, when Reebok comes along and says, we're going to give you half a million dollars and 250 mm -hmm. is going to go to the women's champion and 250 is going to go to the men's champion. That's yes. the end of the story. And we've actually, <laughs> guess what? We've already, we've already seen that happen For in sure. this golf. Yeah. Guess what? I, I actually just realized this about a year ago and i'm really excited about this okay so the gopro mountain games yes that are held in colorado yep. right yeah there i signed up for it this year it's non-sanctioned that you still use pdga rules so it's basically a pdga tournament from what yep. i can tell it's just not sanctioned right they offer the same payout for men and women yeah same payout same i mean even though um i so i looked at last year's and there were only like six women but there were like hundreds of men really? and the men's winner got a thousand dollars and the women's winner got a thousand dollars. Awesome. Right. And so awesome. it just makes, so that even more, especially when we talk about, you know, surfing, CrossFit, yep. tennis, yep. we see these other sports doing it. 
right? And especially the, you know, CrossFit and surfing are more um, contemporary sports. For sure. Disc golf has been around since the 70s. Right. Right. Um, so it makes me really think that even though this, the intention of the payout structure was not to make sure there's no women who play this sport. That was not the intention. I guarantee totally. it. I, totally. I don't believe that it was on purpose. But right. I do think it has contributed to the current state we're in. And it should be something that we evaluate as, For sure. you know, as a, a structural element that is not helping this cause. For sure. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, that the whole that whole piece about entry fees and payouts and stuff is like it's a much bigger conversation, obviously. But I think you've touched on some some really good stuff there uh, with how to maybe address address some of that pieces. So, uh, if we can stick with maybe some of the tournament stuff, uh, I have some of the women's asking who have sent me some questions asking about like, um, like one of the questions was, do you think a women's only disc golf channel would be beneficial or detrimental to the sport in terms of having centralized place for media coverage as a resource for women? Um, and uh, like I said, we've talked about the FPO coverage already a little bit and how, mm-hmm. um, how that would work. My initial thoughts would be if I take a look at how it's gone with other sports, like if we look at like the WNBA or like um, women's professional soccer and some of those other sports, it hasn't. It hasn't been successful, I don't think, as they would have liked to it have been. Um, at this point, I think that the media coverage between the men and the women is good. Like when you have, there's multiple media organizations out there that we're, we're both familiar with um, that do a, a good job of presenting. And like you said, you've been behind the camera and uh, doing some of the voiceovers afterwards for some of this stuff or even for the, probably some for live coverage as well. There seems to be a good quality and a willingness to invest to a point, right? Like, so uh, as an example, uh, the Majestic just happened, right? Um, And there was a lot of male participants. There was a small field of female participants. I understand that there's a lot of things that happened around that uh, for late registrations and because of COVID and everything else that maybe contributed to those pieces. But there was no, not that I'm, as far as I'm aware, there's no, FPO coverage of the Majestic from this from this year, right? So, um, and I understand that having FPO coverage is, it's not a right, it's a privilege. Um, and that it's independent organizations that are providing these, this coverage. Uh, it's not mandated by the PDGA per se, or... Um, it actually, they tried to mandate it. I okay. am not sure. I am actually not sure what, where that rule went. Okay. But I know at the beginning of last year, Okay. Might have been the year before, but at least for sure in the last two years. Right. Um, I was having some qu- um, conversations with Terry Miller. Right. Who has always been really great to cover um, women's for sure. uh, tournaments. Yep. Um, about how the PDGA had mandated that if you are a media person, you have to provide equal coverage to men and women. Right. Which me- meant that um, if Terry has funding to go cover the third card of the open men, he also has to cover a card of women with that same funding. Right. Right. So it kind of put them in a really, it put them in a, it put the media teams in a pretty tough position when the PDGA tried to mandate that they do equal coverage of both. I'm not right. sure where that rule is right now. Steve Hill would be a great person to talk yeah. about, talk to For that, sure. talk to you about that. They made, yep. I think they've kind of stepped back from trying to, um, to require that, even though I think it's still suggested, you know, yeah. um, one other interesting part about that is, that oftentimes the women's media will get paid less by quite a bit to do our media. Okay. Than, than, so um, like the, the actual media. organization. So like uh, yes. you mentioned Terry, so like the disc golf guy yes. actually gets paid less money to cover the women than he would say the men's Sign- cards. Significantly less. Okay. So um, it shows that tournament directors or those with the funds who are giving the funds to the people are also on board with it being less valuable. Okay. Right. So yeah. when you have less money being spent on a product, you're going to put out a much less product For sure. and then a, a lesser product. And then in the right. end, the production is less right. and the viewers see that, you know, we right. see this issue in other women's sports where, um, you know, the WNBA will only have like two cameras, whereas the NBA has like nine cameras <laughs> right. you know, and you get all these great yeah. reactions and they put a, just a ton of production, um, production investment into those particular ones and then then people say well women's isn't as good to watch well 
also it's not as good to watch because <laughs> the production itself is you know cost yeah. twice as you know twice as uh, or half as much to make or For they sure. had half as much funding to actually produce it you For know sure. so i don't know if there's something out there that uh would would fix that but it's certainly a consideration that you know tournament directors if you're paying them production companies less for the women than uh you know that you're contributing basically to a lesser production but then right. there's the other side of it when you're like we're happy we're just even getting coverage for sure you know and yeah. you know i'll take less coverage lesser coverage than no coverage for sure you know so yeah. it's it's you know i'm i'm not trying to create absolutes but uh no, no, no. it is something to consider on you know why maybe it is less entertaining is because the production production value isn't there right um yeah there's gosh there's so much there's so <laughs> much to this topic it's it's mind-boggling but you can feel free to keep sharing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah. yeah i don't know i kind of i kind of lost my train of thought there that's though. okay it's all good <laughs> So I don't know where I was going with that, but I was, <laughs> I was on a, I was on a soapbox of some sort. That's okay. Those are okay to have. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask a little bit of a follow-up question then. So I have another question here from some female uh, followers that asked, any suggestions for women entering tournaments, for example, pre-tournament habits, tips, tricks, um, and what about during the tournament? So I mean, we maybe mm -hmm. already talked about the bathroom issue. Make sure you've got some toilet paper in your bag or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there different, is there things that you could like, and uh, maybe tournaments, like tournaments is obviously one piece, but I think that we can also maybe talk about leagues. Like I played league last night um, in a smaller town here in, in rural Alberta and there was a couple of females. Uh, I got to be car on the card with one of them, and it was awesome. Oh man, it was so much fun. Uh, it was uh, we had there was three of us on a card together, and it was truly so much fun. Uh, she played from different tees, um, but was competitive with us on the course, and I mean, I enjoyed it. But did, did is, you feel like it was unfair that she got to throw from shorter tees than you? Not at all. I thought it was totally reasonable because like there's holes that are. Like there's guy like I'm a, I don't want to say internet distance. I, I can throw 400, which isn't ama anything amazing at all. But there was there was holes where I had to take two full pumps, just to get it within like an approach distance of the basket, right? And I'm like, well, do I think it's unfair that she got to start 150 feet closer to the pin? No. <laughs> Would well, you think it was unfair if it was me? I don't think it was unfair. I think that while well, you're like a hundred points rated better than me already, so <laughs> would it be? But, but, but it, that's a great but question, if, you though. Know, but it, if we're gonna make it okay for yeah. this particular group, is it okay for all of this group? Yeah, and you know, I, or is it you know once you become a pro woman, maybe you don't get the short tees when it comes to local leagues or whatever? I don't know. Yeah, and I think that I think that that's a great question. And where I would go with an answer for that is I would probably look to the sport of ball golf um, and how they adjust uh, the tees for men and women within the sport of ball golf. So even within the sport of ball golf, they have generally a ladies tee, a men's tee, and then even within that, there's like a championship tee pad that's like a superhuman go tee off over here kind of thing, right? So, um, and so maybe that's how you take a look at it and say, okay, well, Sarah is a very good female player um, and could play from, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say the guys tees because I don't think that's the right way of wording it. The more advanced tees will say um, and play on an equal playing field. If you chose to play from the other tees where the other females are playing from, I, I mean, that's totally, uh, I, don't, I don't have an issue with that. I think that's totally up to you. Uh, to because let's be honest like part of the reason I if you're playing tournament play and everybody was playing from the longer tees then I would say play from the longer tees uh, not I'm not I mean females if all the other females are playing from the longer tees then play for the from those tees for uh, to make sense from a tournament competitive perspective for your division but especially if you're playing like I said in a league play situation or a casual play situation um, and for you and you say you showed up yesterday and you know, like, you know what, I feel really comfortable playing from the longer tees. Uh, I feel that would reflect my ability and my competitiveness on this course and want to, I think that you could, but if you also said, you know what, I'm here for fun and I want to play and I want to enjoy this course. And for me, the best way to do that would be to play from the shorter tees, have at her. 
right? I don't like even if there was guys that wanted to play from the shorter tees yesterday, I don't think anybody would have really cared actually. Yeah, I guess when there's money on the line, it's hard to create those fair situations. But for yeah. league, I can totally see like you know at your leisure, what we'll yeah. play from wherever you want. Now one one um, I don't know if you're aware, but like with with the PDGA, they have um, gold, blue, white, and red designations. Yeah, and those are based upon rating. Yeah, and there's even been tournaments played where you play within your rating, not within your, not in a gender or age protected division, right. right? So they get rid of those two types of protected divisions and then just right. put you in a division with people who are similarly rated and found it very, and they found it very um, competitive. Right. And I think at the amateur level, that's probably pretty fun. Yeah. You know, um, I don't, I don't think that it's appropriate to apply that logic to the professional side right um because it would essentially make women unable to make a living playing disc golf for sure it would take that away yeah um yeah you know because as a as a 968 rated woman i'm still not even competitive with the open men i'm not even close to the cash line right um as we've even seen it with a few of the women playing the usgdc over the years right for sure um yeah, yeah. So I think that that's one one way um, that at the amateur level, I think, you know, playing by rating, playing whatever your rating is, is what's going to dictate which tee you play from. Right. So right? I, I participate in a, a, some, somewhat of a fringe sport of, uh, I think I can fairly call it a fringe sport, the sport of powerlifting. And it's, you don't get to pick your division. It's auto-populated essentially for you. And so hmm. if you say... Uh, so for me, I would say I'm a male who's 40 years old. They say, okay, that's the division you're in. You don't get to pick. I don't get to say that I'm an advanced male or I'm a rookie male or I just, it says you're an advanced, you're a, a male athlete and you're 40 years old. You go in the, uh, what would be the equivalent of like a MA40 division. That's it. End of the story. You don't get to choose to whether you want to go advanced or you want to go intermediate or a rec or whatever. Uh, you get auto-populated into that uh, division uh, based on my based on my age. Now, if I was under the age bracket of 40, uh, the way it works is within the sport of powerlifting is it's just considered an open division. So anybody between the ages of, I want to make sure I get this right, 24 and 39 is in the open division, and they're all together. And so it doesn't matter if you can, like I said, deadlift 600 pounds or deadlift 60 pounds you all get put into the same division. It's automatically sort of populated that way. The way that I think that that could work within the sport of disc golf, I really like with what you're saying. And I think that it could also contribute somewhat to a sandbagging issue is to say, register for the event and based on age and uh, rating, you are going to get auto populated into a division. So if we have say 60 people register, we're going to take the first 20 people. Those are going to be advanced. The 20, the next 20 people are going to be intermediate and the next 20 people are going to be rec just pure, based purely on their sort of like a rating system um, to yeah. create, create a balance that way. Now, if there is aged brackets, you would have to include that. And if there was a uh, people who said, you know what, I want to play for money, put me in the open division. Okay. You're in there and you've chosen that. And that's a, a knowing that you're choosing to play as sort of a professional player. Um, but rather than having people say, uh, oh, I'm an intermediate player, or I'm an advanced player, I'm a recreational player. Um, I mean, so I've been on kind of an interesting journey uh, trying to set a Guinness World Record for the most disc golf courses played in a year. Nowhere near what Avery has, has accomplished. Uh, so there's a gentleman named Larry Kirk in 2012. He played 50 courses in 50 states in 50 days, which is quite the feat. Um, and he set the Guinness record. I met him on one of those days. <laughs> he's a super good dude. He, he's, if you yeah. actually watch, uh, if you watch either NPO or FBO coverage, he's actually in the background of so many videos. It is unbelievable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I talked to Larry and I went, went to try to break his record. And uh, I, in doing so, I played in, a, in a, several different PDJ events in, in multiple different countries. And so last year, I think it was last year I played as a rec player, an intermediate player, an advanced player, an MA40 player, and an open player last year. <laughs> uh, based on, depending on where I was, when I was in the Netherlands, I played as an open player because they didn't have any other division for me to play in. <laughs> uh, 
when I played at home on my home courses, I played as an advanced player. When I traveled to some of the courses in the United States where the competition is much higher, I played as an intermediate player, right? So when I first started the season last year, I played as a rec player, right? So um, that I think all of that could be sorted out in the wash instead of people going like, oh, I'm traveling to the States, so I have to drop down a division, or oh, I'm traveling over to this country in Europe, so I should move up a division. And just going, mm -hmm. let's just put everybody in and go, you're here, you're here, you're here, right? So there would be a lot more. Um, there's a lot of little things that would need to be worked out with for, sure. a, totally. with a, for a change like that. But what I do, what I do like is that it's addressing an issue that not, it's not just um, the Canadian population that's experienced this, but you know, everybody experiences this in that at a local tournament, they'll probably play, you know, an advanced player might, a, a true advanced player might play open a bunch of times at local tournaments, right? regional tournaments, you know, they might find that the MP40 is where they belong. Um, right. But if they go play AM Worlds, they're like, okay, I'm going to play advanced. Right. You know, totally. um, and it, people change the division they play in based on where they are. And different regions have different, different distribution of totally. players. Totally. You know, so people do end up switching. And tons of women uh, ask me, what division should I play? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, what does your rating say? You know, yeah. well, if this is a big event, then I'd follow your rating. If it's a smaller event, you know, I'd find the field to play in. Right. Um, but yeah, it's certainly an issue and people definitely don't know what to play in. And there's so many options as well. I know the PDGA really wants to keep a lot of those options because disc golf is one of those sports where you lose a lot and you know, win a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you, you lose almost every tournament you play, except for yeah. a few that you win, you yeah. know, so the more winners you can create, the more success people are going to feel, yeah. feel, and the more connected to the sport they're going to be. For sure. So we definitely, I understand why they have so many divisions so that we can have so many people feeling that success, but it also creates a lot of confusion. And especially in the women's side, it creates situations where there's women playing against themselves. Right. I've seen tournaments where there's seven women playing and, they're in six different divisions. Right, totally. You know, and I get it because there's just not, you know, they want to play where their skill puts them and it's not their fault that there's not somebody there to play against. Asterix, and how is it fair though, for them? Yeah. They all I mean, get stuck on the same card anyways. And how, but how is it, totally. How is it fair <laughs> though for a woman to play against somebody who's 150 points higher than her in the same division? For sure. You know, that's yeah. also not fair. So right. that's again, just a numbers thing that once there's more number, when there's more people then there'll be more in between um, players. So you'll have more meaningful competition. For sure. So, you know, but. So yeah, going back, I guess going back to our question. So if women wanting to enter their first tournaments, maybe yeah, like yeah. where would I you got suggest? Some good advice. Yeah, hit, let's go, let's <laughs> go, let's advice. go. Okay. Uh, first of all, find a women's only event. Okay, great. Like I know that they're not everywhere, but right. I have, been cataloging all of them over the last uh, couple of months and okay. there are there have been thousands of women's only events um, okay. and I think that especially if you have one near you or within a couple of hours maybe up to even three or four hours okay. if you're worried about playing a tournament go to a women's only only event okay. there have been there has been a you know recently more recently in the last couple of years there has been there are women out there now that don't even play mixed tournaments they don't okay. play any events that have men involved. Right. You know, they only play the women's only events. Right. Um, because they're just so much different um, of an environment that we're so used to, um, we're used to in a mixed event. You know, as much as we want to try to treat women the same, I mean, people don't care about, you know, they don't, they don't care about a reward ceremony. They don't care to watch us live. Um, you know, it, we're always announced second. Right. You know, beef, you know. Did the DGPT try to change that this year, though? Right. Well, the DGPT has um, forever, for their since their inception, they have been really good advocates for women and have tried to push the envelope and make changes and try different things to see what seems to work and what seems to um, really help elevate the women. Because I think so, yeah, they, they, they flipped it and put the women uh, first this year, I think, right? And so that yeah. So uh, the history of that is. Um, Originally, the women and the men um, were kind of spliced in together. Okay. They would show um, the men's card, and then when the men were walking up the, up the fairway, they'd show how the women played that hole earlier in the day. So we'd play okay. early in the morning right. so that they had time to record it, 
splice it up in the pieces, and then insert it into the men's coverage. Okay. And I think that worked pretty good, you know, okay. but in the end, we weren't getting full round coverage for the women. Right. Right. So then they tried to take it to the next step where we're like, all right, well, screw this. We're going to have two, you know, we're gonna have, we'll have a full crew on the women and broadcast that. And then we'll have a full crew on the men and broadcast that. Right. But then what we find is that the people who are watching the men's game aren't really interested in watching the women's game. Okay. You know, whereas before they were kind of force fed it during um, kind of commercials of sorts. Right. Right. Um, so I think that they have now changed that around and now they are integrating the two. Okay. So that we're also capturing those viewers that are really not sold yet on the women's game. Yep. Um, we're capturing those viewers and they're in order to watch the end of the men's final, they actually must endure watching the women <laughs> play the front nine. <laughs> so um, I think that that's a good move for now. And I, okay. and to your question about a disc golf network for women, I think ideally in the future, I think that it, I don't think it would ever hurt. Okay. I definitely don't think it would ever hurt. Um, but at this point, I don't know if it would be as helpful as a, of an investment as okay. it could be in the future. However, I think that there's a stepping stone here. Um, okay. We can certainly curate all the women's um, videos and put them into one particular place. And I think okay. that the PDGA, PDGA or, um, you know, I think that any, all of the media companies actually could curate their work and add a playlist of all the women's coverage. Okay. Great you idea. Know, I um, like that. I think that that's a very easy first step. Okay. And then um, in the future, I mean, I'd like to see how this year goes. We've only had the one, or I guess it's been the two Pro Tour events, Waco and, and the Memorial, where we've really gotten to see how this new format shakes out. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, time will tell. And I, I applaud the, P, uh, the PDGA and the Pro Tour for just trying new things and just seeing how they work, yeah. you know, because that's, that's what we got to keep doing. Awesome. So um, as far as, so picking tournaments. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, event. don't, now, yeah, you're you talking about women's event. If you can't pick a women's event, definitely try to pick an event where there are other women. Okay. Right. Um, and then also. So is that sure, like you know, creeping on disc golf scene? Is that what you're doing to figure that out or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Or it's, <laughs> or, or it's you recruiting, recruiting your friends. Okay. Who you know that play to say, Hey, okay. let's all play this tournament so that we have awesome. a field to play in. Okay. Um, you know, if, if you're the only woman and you got to go play a tournament, um, you know, I, I all the power to you. I really hope that you feel comfortable and that the community that you choose to play in is welcoming to you and also not in a bad way. <laughs> right. Uh, not overly welcoming. <laughs> well, you, you um, must have been in that experience. You must have done that several times. What is that experience like? Or has, what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, no, when I was playing in St. Louis, I was the only girl for sure. All the time. Um, but I also grew up with brothers. I'm the youngest of three kids and I have two older brothers who I was constantly competing against. You know, they're the ones that pushed me to be more of an athlete my whole life. Right. Um, you know, so I'm not intimidated by guys, but I know of so many women that would, would die if they, if a guy was watching them do try to do something athletic, you know, like right. women are not, you know, just when you just talk about kind of gender roles and um, certain opportunities in life, like women just are not encouraged as much to play sports. You know, we play, you know, if we look back in old school, we play with dolls, boys play with basketballs. Right. You know, um, so if women are not exposed to athletics at an early age and they're uncomfortable with their ability to, to, to be athletic or do something like that. And then there's a, a there's 90 men and one woman out there doing it. They're the only girl. Like, I don't think, you know, that, that's it. No wonder there's no women that play, right. you know, like, and it's not the men's fault per se, but it's also like, it's just not the right environment right. Um, for that type of woman. Now there are women who are like gung ho and there's women that don't even want to play against other women. They're like, I'll play against the guys all day long. Let's go. <laughs> you know? And, and right now, like, I feel like that's the kind of women that are able to right. be successful in those situations, but right. that's not a huge percentage of just the overall population of women. Right. You know, so if we're trying to tap into that other part of it, then we have to make sure that the environment fits something that women would want to do. Okay, so we've got try women's event only if not recruit all your friends and family <laughs> or creep people on disc golf scene, which let's be honest, I do it all the time too. I'm, I'm always looking prior to an event. I'm like, oh, who's registered in my division? Oh, who's this guy? Who's that guy? Uh, so, I mean, I think everybody's doing that anyways, but 
Um, yeah, yeah so one quick note about that, though. I do want to <laughs> say that this happens way too often, especially among women. And I'm guilty as too. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I am. But <laughs> a lot of women will look at registration for an event and see that there aren't any women. Mm. And so they're like, okay, well, I'm not going to sign up because I don't want to be the only one playing. But, but then if everybody did that, women, nobody said that. Five other women did that too. You know, so um, I do kind of wish that there was um, some kind of a Incentive. rule with the PDGA that, you know, I, I would want, I want to, I want all these women to just sign up for the event and hope that somebody else signs up and maybe they will because they see another woman there. But right. if they're not, if, if, if they sign up for an event and then there ends up not being any women there, they have to get, ask for a refund 30 days prior to the event in order to right. get a full refund. Right. You know, and to me, like, you know, that, that would discourage me from signing up. Not only am I going to lose the, you know, the little fee, the dollar 34 fee yeah. to disc golf scene, but yeah. then I might not get my money back if no women actually decide to play. So do you think so, there's some kind of incentives that could be created to facilitate female registration for events? I mean, I'm always, I always advocate for like, at least you know, my, my realm is the pro tour and the elite events for and sure. i'm always advocating for local clubs to pay the local the regional pro women's entry fees okay right because you know the le regional like with the the fact that there's like 32 women on the road you right. know if 32 women come to your town um and you're the local pro but they're all better than you then you're going to finish in the bottom of the field what's your incentive to sign up you know that's what's going to happen right you know like you don't necessarily, you're not a fan girl. You're not like, I just want the opportunity to play with Paige Pierce. Maybe you're not that girl, right? And you're just like, you know who you are. You want to play, but you're like, I'm going to get smoked, you know, right. but I want to represent my local thing, but there's no chance I'm going to actually get close to the cash line. Well, in, especially in those situations, you know, I really think that the club's sponsoring their local pro women to play regional events. Love it. That gives them the experience in there. They don't have, you know, there's not such a, a of a burden on the cost, especially because the big events, they're a couple hundred dollars. Right. It's not like you're just yep. paying 30 or $50. You're totally. $200. And, you know, maybe you're having to take work off on the Friday. You know, it's just the getting the regional women opportunities to really show what they can do. I think some can do really, really well, yep. especially because it'll be their home courses and for sure. they can make a name for themselves, possibly get some sponsorships, you yep. know, but if they don't get in there because they're like, I don't have a chance. Uh, I don't know that one. I always encourage clubs to, to do that if they can for their pro women, for their locals. Um, mm -hmm. But incentives for registering, I mean, I've always considered the idea, there's some problems with it, but I've always considered the idea of doing cashless pre-registration for women. Okay. Right. So you don't have to fork over the cash right away. You know, um, you pay, pay, pay the tournament director when you get there. Right. Um, it, there are some problems with that. For sure. Um, especially on the amateur side, because usually a lot of the registration funding will go to um, creating the players' packs. Yeah. So it could be a burden on the TD. For bit. sure. Um, but I think that, you know, I think TDs have the right and ability to do that on their own if they are in a region where that wouldn't be a problem for them, um, but, but it would um, increase participation. So do you think increasing women in, in a media presence would make a difference with, with that as well? So I, uh, I'm going to give an example that I'm really familiar with. So again, being a collegiate coach here in uh, Canada, I know that the league that I've coached in for several years mandated, uh, mandated is maybe the wrong word, strongly encouraged by the leadership to do a two-thirds, one-thirds um, media marketing model within the, every school within the conference. So the, it was supposed to be two-thirds weighted to female uh, social media posts to one-thirds um, social media posts for men. Ah, with, the, with the idea being that we are going to highlight and promote uh, our female collegiate athletes uh, two-thirds of the time and promote our male athletes one of their time now when it was things like athletes of the week or players of the game that was exactly 50 50 because we put a male athlete of the game female athlete of the game 50 50 no issues there but in promotional and marketing materials it was strongly encouraged from the leadership of the conference to say we want to increase uh spectatorship for our female 
sports. We also want to increase female athletes enrolling in post-secondary educations. We want uh, other younger female athletes, whether that be at the high, the high school levels or club levels, to look up and go, these are the athletes that I want to strive to be towards. Mm -hmm. And how we are going to achieve that, or one of the ways that we're going to achieve that, is to strongly encourage all of the schools within our conference to uh, bias their social media posts to two thirds female uh, mm. exposure to on their on their social media accounts. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Now I think <laughs> I think it's a great idea. No, because I mean, if if you really you know, obviously we talked about how the male sport kind of grows organically, and sure. you know, the media companies are just pounding at the door to try to get in there to do coverage right you know of the men yep but you know we have to like beg people to do coverage for the women right right so yep. if the goal is really to increase numbers of participation um in in women and other and other groups then we got to put our money and our time where our mouth is yeah 100 percent. you know i mean yeah it okay the men's sport brings in so much more views and brings in so much more money you know so, I mean, a lot of people will use that as the reason why, well, it's inappropriate to do that. This men's side is doing all this, you know, but if growing one particular underdeveloped sect of your, of your activity is actually important to you, then disproportionately promote it, right? right? Yeah, I mean, totally. if, if the equal, if, I mean, we're not even getting equal, cover, equal promotion right now, right. you know, but if we went, if we went on the other side of the board and tried to go extra and less, then, you know, that might be the way the needle gets pushed where we are moving that needle to 9% and 10% and 11% yeah. rather than everything growing and we're just stuck here at this small percentage of participate participants. So if you were to pick up your phone right now and scroll through the PDGA Instagram page, <laughs> uh, the ratio of male to female is not terrible, but there is a huge discrepancy in black and indi indigenous and people of color to, yes. to the point where it's almost none. I, I went, I went somebody, the reason that I even went through that exercise is again, referring it back to CrossFit, the community that I have some familiarity with in all of this stuff going down. Uh, and there was like, so the leadership of the, one of the leaders of the CrossFit community said something, uh, with regards to George Floyd and COVID-19 and it was, uh, it was inappropriate. And, uh, as a result, everything's kind of gone sideways, but one of the major gyms within the sport said, you know what, like, let's take a look at the CrossFit Instagram page. And if you go through it, there is only this much percentage of non-white athletes on the CrossFit page. So CrossFit is saying we're trying to do diversity, but then isn't, like you said, putting their money where their mouth is, right? And so if we were to take a, and this is not taking a shot at the PDG, I don't mean it in that way at all. And I'm just, it's just a point of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You can't make a difference if you don't know that a difference needs to be made or if you haven't really actually taken a step back and realized, oh man, that's what's actually happening. And I, like I said, I don't think anybody has done it with any intention or malicious intent, mm -hmm. but to really take a step back and go, oh, wow. There's only this is three, where we are. Three, yeah, there's only what three pictures. Have, what, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what could have contributed to this? Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it really makes sense to disproportionately promote something that you're trying to push. Right. Right? I mean... If we just look at, okay, if we just look at, you know, let's, let's just say that there's 50% men and 50% women. If we right. just use what the world looks like, um, then that's basically following the status quo. Right. You know, and, yeah. and if at the very least we could get 50-50, that would actually help, you know, but I really like what you're saying. Um, and also on to the um, uh, ethnicity, um, you know, I, what, I think it's 18 or 20% is um, African-American in the U.S. or something like that. You know, I mean, if we could at least get 20%, you know, at least follow, you know, the percentages in the world, right. you know, so that we're not a different, you know, so that we're not basically um, only grabbing the people that are actually playing, you right. know, right now, um, yeah. if we could actually kind of mimic those percentages in our own social media, but right. even more so disproportionately represent groups that we're trying to push. Right. right. I mean, at the very least, we should be representing the world with the proportions that exist in the world and not For just sure. within this golf. 
For sure. But if we want to make a difference disproportionately, um, both ethnicity and gender, I think are, I think that that's a really, really astute idea. I think that's great. I, I would, I'd present that to the PDGA. I I'm might. I'll give, you, I'll give you credit though. <laughs> <laughs> do it up, do whatever you need to do so that we can make this sport better for everybody. That's totally good. So uh, we've been together for a good amount of time tonight. And I think we've talked about a lot of things and I don't want to cut it short. If you want to keep talking, I'm totally open to continuing going, but I also want to respect your time and I want to respect time of people who are maybe tuning in to follow the conversation that we've been had. So um, maybe let's give, give those ladies a tip they're asking for a tip. Sarah, you're the number five player in the world. Give us some tips and advice um, before you go. And then maybe a closing statement uh, just on okay. your overall thoughts on, on things. All right. So tips and advice, um, throw light under stable discs, right? Even, even maybe starting with mids um, and putters, maybe throw in a fairway, but keep them, keep them light at first so that you're you're able to actually work through your form without having to actually put a bunch of power behind the disc to make it fly. In the end, as you work through your form, you may find that you'll like heavier discs, um, but at the beginning, throw really light stuff so that you're actually moving your body in a proper way without actually having to, you know, have major contraction on those muscles. Right. I find for, you know, for me, when I'm trying to overpower something, that's when my form just goes to crap. Right. Um, so in order to actually get your form down, light discs, mid ranges, putters, keep it simple. Um, the next thing I would say is to absolutely video yourself throwing okay. in slow-mo from multiple angles and compare okay. what your body looks like and the things that your body is doing to, to a, maybe a similarly body, a, a, a professional who has a similar body type as right. you, um, or maybe even a similar athletic background Right. Um, whether that could be baseball, softball, volleyball, basketball, I find that a lot of my volleyball muscles have been both a hindrance and a help For in sure. disc golf. And yep. I've had to identify the parts of, you know, the parts of my athletic background that are helping me with the disc golf. And then I've had to retrain some of the parts of my athletic disc background that aren't good for disc golf. For sure. You know, so definitely take some video of your form. And then, um, and then, um, you know, finally, just, gosh, find a good couple players that, not, not good skilled, but find a good crew to go with, okay. to go play with all the time. You know, I mean, the biggest part about disc golf that I love is that I didn't realize I liked at the beginning. I, I liked it, but I didn't realize how important it would be to me is the community of people. Yeah. You know, the relationships totally. you make with people and the lessons that you learn because of those relationships in a competitive atmosphere. Yeah. Um, man, it has taught me more than I, I could ever imagined. You yeah. know, it's not just about having learned how to throw a disc and getting the lowest score. Well, you know, so. if I, I'll interject for two seconds before you give us kind of your closing thoughts is that, like I said, tr being able to travel around and play with a lot of different people, uh, even my own story, like I came to the sport through injury in that I wasn't able to compete and play in the, my sport the way I would want it to anymore. And so a friend invited me to go out and throw a disc and I was like, oh, wow, this doesn't bother my injury and I can and still be competitive within this. Uh, but then, like I said, traveling around, playing in a lot of tournaments and playing in different parts of the world, there's a similarity to almost everybody's story in that it was uh, the sport The sport changed my life and mm -hmm. it provided me community or it stopped me from committing crimes that I was committing crimes that sent me to jail or uh, it provided me mental health when I was struggling through going through divorce or it provided me with uh, some some community while I was going through PTSD, uh, and it was just, it's been absolutely amazing that the the universality of the story of disc golf is it is life changing, and the community and the sport are a humongous piece of that, and I, I, they're so intertwined, um, mm -hmm. it is unbelievable. But yeah, so on that note, give us your sort of closing pieces on. Um, on where, where you're at. Um, you can share maybe a little bit about where your, your aspirations for, for this season, or you can, you can add in some, like some final thoughts on the women in sport, uh, as well. And yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I guess overall, um, with women, 
I really just feel like getting out and playing with other women is a really big part of developing those relationships. Now that doesn't mean you can't play with men and you can't, it doesn't mean I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't play with your boyfriend or don't play with your husband or right. don't play with men. I'm not saying that at all, but right. um, I think it's really important to foster those female relationships and play with people who are having, you know, experiencing some of the similar things that you are in relation to form, um, body type, um, and then just your social experience in the world. For sure. You know, so, and if you're able to start a women's league, I think that those are a, a very important part um, for women to just get together with each other once a week and play some disc golf. Awesome. Um, leagues start from, you know, two people and, you know, it takes, sometimes it takes six months to get another person. Sometimes it takes two years to get, you know, a handful. Right. You know, so um, it's definitely something that we want to make sure we stick with and, and also involve, you know, anybody in, you, it doesn't have to be just women starting a women's league as well. You know, men can facilitate these leagues. For sure. Um, as well. So definitely some of that stuff. I'm really looking forward to, you know, the rest of the season. I have a bunch of clinics planned um, yeah. and then I'll be competing just really heavily. There has been a, a huge development in the women's game for the fall, having the women's national championships, yep. we're actually yep. going to get a chance to compete at Rock yep. Hill for the first time in 20 years. Yeah. Um, as a as our in our own division, so yep. this is, you know, very it's awesome, and I'm really excited to play, and I'm really excited for women to get exposure on such an uh, iconic course. For sure, hundred percent. Um, definitely look forward to that, and um, tune in to the ladies. I. I can't imagine they wouldn't have coverage for us for that. So <laughs> no. you should be able to. For sure. If they don't have coverage, I would I would go out there with my camera and do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hold my phone. I'm gonna throw this shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and any women who have questions, certainly reach out to me. I'm I'm available and happy to chat with you know any of your concerns, or at least I can refer you um, to um, someone who can help you with what you're looking for. The women's committee right now is dedicated to growing that, growing this side of the sport. Yep. You can also reach out to anybody on the women's committee. You can find that at pdga.com backslash women. Yep. Um, we're creating, we're trying to create some standards. Like I said, with the um, statistical analysis, the survey we just put out. Um, and then we are also working on social media. So we're hoping to do um, a weekly little live Facebook awesome. group, um, kind of women chat with women about disc golf we'll have lots of guests so um if they could you know women could follow the pdga women's page um they'll stay updated on that and then last but not least the women's global event started in 2012 yeah. from val jenkins it has made yeah. a huge difference in the participation of women and so many women have found that event as their first event they've ever played and they haven't looked back since so yeah. looking forward to that next um may yeah. Um, so put that on your calendar, try yeah. to find an event that you can get to, or I mean, it's a regional situation. So yeah. maybe it's you, um, registering the event for that weekend as a women's global event, and you could even play in your own hometown. So awesome. Ta-da. Thank you. MVP Disports, mm -hmm. um, uh, Paragon, uh, Rick Aroons and Zuka, uh, and Birdie Fuel for all their support. Definitely check out their products here. Sure. Uh, they, they're disc golf and to the max awesome thank you so much for your time tonight sarah and i'm just gonna throw this in there uh for those of you sarah put it out to say contact me uh, i did contact her and she responded and that's how we were able to get here so she will respond to you uh and now you sarah you're gonna be inundated with people hopefully <laughs> that's okay but that's awesome uh like i said she responded um just a truly genuine person um excited about the sport and her ability to advocate for the sport as a whole but also for women in the sport so i thank you for for that sarah and uh with that I'm and i wanted to wish i wanted to wish you luck real quick though um good luck with your campaign thank you i appreciate yeah. that yeah the, the biggest field of uh the biggest field of candidates ever <laughs> yeah. um is uh, your competition for that position so um it'll be a tough race but uh, you know i think when uh, doing things like this is really going to put your name out there um and show the world what kind of person you are awesome uh, so i have a, a unique qualification for the position in that i am both the only canadian candidate and the only european candidate on the ballot as i have dual citizenship 
So oh, <laughs> I go. didn't let's... know. That. I knew you were from Canada, but I didn't know that Europe part. Yeah, I actually have a British uh, British passport as well. So let's get Europe behind me as well as Canada. <laughs> Not that I'm saying I don't want the Americans as well, but I think uh, I think almost uh, there's one other gentleman who's not from the United States as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, awesome. Thank yeah, you there's only one um, international individual on the board of directors at the moment. So yeah, I mean, yeah. with being a sport that we're trying to expand to the entire world, we should probably have people from the world. Totally. On the board of directors. <laughs> yeah, totally. Awesome. So, well, good luck to you.